Okay, now with that, I want to come to the main attraction of the event or the main attraction of uh, this particular movement so far, and that is the keynote talk by Urs uh, Hovel from Google. Uh, in this particular audience, he does not really need an introduction. He has been a legend in when it comes to network infrastructure and the web infrastructure and so on. So I thought I would only try to make two points about Urs. First is, if you look at this particular growth chart for Google, again, this is one of many ways to look at the growth of Google. The details do not matter, obviously. But you can see the pattern, you can see the trend. Urs started here. Even before Google had any revenues, he was the first VP of engineering uh, at Google, before Google had any revenues. Today, he is the senior VP of technical infrastructure as well as a Google fellow. Now you can see the huge impact he has had in success of Google all the way from pre-revenue to where it is today. And through Google, having an impact on the society at a large as well. I'm sure we all know that this is very, very impressive. Not only that, if you take a closer look, through all of this, he has not aged at all. I look at his picture from before and now, and I see that he has not aged at all. <laughs> now, I want to make one more observation in the context of OpenFlow and SDN, and that is, he has been a champion, supporter, as well as a practitioner of OpenFlow and SDN. Though he's not considered an inventor of OpenFlow or SDN, it turns out, he and his team have been practicing what can be thought of SDN for some years, right? And since then, he also quickly understood the value of OpenFlow and SDN for the larger networking and cloud infrastructure community and has worked very hard to bring OpenFlow and SDN where it is today. And we thank him for that. And with that, here is Urs as our keynote speaker. Thank you, Guru. Uh, wow, after such an introduction, I, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you. And I, I just uh, decided to change the topic of my talk. Uh, so instead of OpenFlow, I'm going to talk about the magic pills that keep me young. And you're going to have a chance to buy them afterwards. Uh, in <laughs> no, um, no, I really am here to, to talk about OpenFlow. And uh, more specifically, what we've been doing uh, in Google. So I'll, I'll show you that um, sort of how we run our backbone. And then what we learned and what makes it hard to run such a backbone and how OpenFlow is helping uh, uh, making that easier. And so I hope to, to convince you that um, uh, in the WAN case, which few people today talk about uh, for OpenFlow, everyone talks about the data center. In the WAN case, there's actually a very, very compelling use case for, for OpenFlow. So um, why do we worry about our backbone? Because we have a lot of traffic. Here's one study from 2010. Uh, that looked at our external facing uh, internet traffic. Uh, we have, of course, lots of applications that um, uh, generate uh, that traffic. Uh, and then on top of that, what you don't see is we also have a lot of traffic on our internal backbone between the data centers, you know, the uh, data replication, the index push from our search engine, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, if you look at a WAN, a large WAN like that, what you would like to see is that, like when you run a larger data center, it's cheaper per unit to run a large thing than a small thing. And unfortunately, in networking, that's not really true. Uh, or it certainly isn't as true as it could be, and it certainly isn't as true as it is in a data center. Right? We've shown, for example, that when you run a large application like Gmail, you can, compare to a small organization running their own email server, you can save literally something like a factor of nearly 100 in terms of compute and energy when you run it at scale, right? In a large network, there's nothing like this. And there are a number of factors that make it hard to save money, even though you have a lot of devices and a lot of networking. Some of these factors are, um, really, or many of these factors have to do with manageability, right? Many of these routers need to be still set up and configured by hand, and so you have more like a linear growth of your cost with the number of devices. And then the devices themselves tend to get more expensive per unit as you scale up. 
in part because they run routing algorithms on it that kind of scale with something like the square of the network or whatever. So you need to buy more expensive CPUs, more expensive uh, controllers, and so on and so on. So this is something that, that you know, makes us unhappy because obviously you know, we'd like to have better economics because many of our products are offered for free. So it's not like we have a lot of margin in, in running them. Um, we believe a solution to that is basically to do the same thing as you do in a data center. In a data center, when you have 10,000 machines, you don't actually manage those 10,000 machines individually. You don't actually log in to that machine and configure it. You have some kind of system that manages them as a pool, right? And then you dispatch your applications on it, et cetera. And, you know, it's mostly automated so that when you, when you manage these machines, you can't really tell the difference between managing, you know, 5,000 and 10,000, right? It's basically the same thing. And so we'd like to do the same thing in the network where the individual box, the network box, isn't actually what you manage. It's really the overall assembly of all the boxes, how they're configured and how they work together to accomplish sort of the overall goal of the network, how they manage the traffic flows on that network. And really, you want to focus your management effort on those traffic flows. Right, on the applications, on your Gmails and your YouTubes and you know, where they go, and not on each individual box. And you also don't want to think about what happens for each individual box when it fails, right? or when a link fails. Right? That should all be sort of reconfigured and maintain the environments that you put in the network. And that's not very easy with today's networking boxes. Right? They're all kind of you know, intended for, for manual configuration, Different vendors have different ideas of how you can, you can monitor them, how you, how you automate them. It's all relatively low level. So I'll show you some more examples of why this is not just expensive to run, but also relatively inefficient in the network. Here's a relatively simple uh, network where I want to see what happens when a link fails. So, so look at this from kind of left to right. The, the round circles with R's are routers. Then you have links with certain uh, uh, capacity. And let's assume we have these three flows on that network today at, at uh, uh, different sizes. And now let's assume that one of these links here breaks. Right? You, know, you have a fiber cut, whatever. So in today's network, what happens is that the adjacent router, R5, tells all the downstream routers or upstream routers that, hey, you know, my link disappeared. And now each of these other routers in the system will autonomously try to kind of reconfigure itself for the new world, right? And they're each responsible for one of the flows that you just saw, saw that, you know, all of which are broken, and they're going to try and repair them. And so, you know, when you, when you retry, you know, one of them is going to be the first one, and he's going to book, um, um, you know, the, the bottom most link. Right? And the other two may have also tried to use that link. They will now fail because the reservation for this path will fail. And so they will retry, right? So someone else wins the next round. You know, someone else uh, wins the next round. And so there's two problems with this approach. First of all, it takes a while for the network after its link failure to kind of settle again, right? Because that, you know, all the boxes kind of need to redefine their world and figure out what's happening. Second, this isn't deterministic. So after the same link failure, if it happens twice, what happens, you know, the state after the failure may be different, just depending on what the timing happened. And in fact, what's even worse, it might be that sometimes the network succeeds in finding a new state that works for all flows, and sometimes it doesn't. Because if the first guy happens to partially use up one of the paths, and block it for a larger flow, then that next larger flow might not find a home, right? And so you might actually have a broken flow in the network. And you can't tell sort of ahead of time. There are, are of course, ways to get around it. You can try to prioritize things, et cetera. But it's very hard because you need to go think about each individual uh, situation. Now, hypothetically, if you had a more centralized solution where you have same network and now this, this, this square box, which is a central traffic engineering box, then you could kind of rejigger this a little bit and say, hey, if the same failure happens again, then R5, which is the closest uh, box, just tells that traffic engine, hey, you know, this link went down, and now this central engine 
decides what to do. They see, you know, that engine sees the, the whole network. It need, knows about all the flows, so it can in one shot compute what the next, you know, what the future state should be, tell all the routers what to do, and, uh, and then, then, then we're done. So a much better, uh, faster uh, way of doing it. It's actually simpler because algorithmically, if you see everything, it's much easier to figure out what the next step should, should be. And it's also deterministic, right? Every time this happens, the same uh, reaction will happen unless your, your input's changed. Um, so to recap, right, right, if you have a more centralized management of your network, and really this is all about traffic and engineering, where you want to guarantee certain quality of service for, your, for the flows that are in your network you uh, uh, can get a better network utilization because you can compute the best placement of all the flows worldwide given your network and given the demand. And when something fails, you know that you can have the next best optimal solution for the flows in this diminished network. So you never leave capacity over because, uh, le you know, leftover, and you don't have to provision extra for these kind of uh, unpredictable uh, side effects. Um, it's fast, so you can, even with a large network, you can compute a new solution um, um, very quickly. You can pre-compute solutions for every single element failure, et cetera, right? It's easy to make this fast. And when I mean fast, I really mean like, you know, one second plus whatever propagation delay you have uh, worldwide, but the order of once a second. And then more importantly, once you have that, you can reason about the network in a much better way, and you can actually have the inputs be more understandable to your application programmers. In a conventional network, if you look at the network configuration, you cannot tell anymore what Gmail is really and, and how you're treating it, or what YouTube is and how you're treating its traffic. That's all lost in very low level mechanisms. And in, if you have a more higher level sort of central point to do, you can actually use that as an, in, as an input and say, for example, Gmail traffic is more important than YouTube traffic. So whenever you have to compromise between the two, pick Gmail. Um, and then more importantly, or actually, uh, you know, often forgotten, but, but really very importantly, when you have the centralized view, it's easier for you to, to do software testing. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit uh, why. So clearly, you're trying to manage a large network. You try to be not having bugs in that network. And in a conventional setup, that's actually pretty hard because each, each uh, box runs a very specialized, highly complicated uh, uh, stack. And you need to have all the boxes kind of interact and you know, there's not even the, the signals that you feed each of these boxes is different, et cetera, et cetera. In this kind of way, you have one traffic engineering server. That traffic engineering server, as a regular part of its operation, needs to get all events in the network, all the control events. And so it's easy to capture them at that point and, for example, replay them later for uh, the testing of your next release. Or just generally speaking, it's easier to to build in testability into this kind of fr framework because you run it in a standard environment, standard software environment, and you can play with it. So that's what we did and that really helped a lot. So we're trying to test the modules that we have in isolation of course, of course first, right? You do the unit tests. But then we also have a test bed that lets you simulate essentially the entire backbone uh, on your workstation or on, on some server in the cloud. And so you can play through a lot of, of scenarios. What happens if two links fail at the same time? What happens if one element misbehaves and, and the link flaps or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, all of that sort of moves the project more t into the realm of how you would run a large software project that is about uh, distributed uh, uh, software. So in this simulated WAN, we have real binaries, both, both of the traffic server uh, binary and the open flow agent on the, that's running on, on the switch. Uh, the hardware, of course, is virtualized. The network, of course, is virtualized. You can't do performance testing in this uh, scenario. That's not what it's for. Um, so you can't say, can I really carry line rate traffic or whatever, right? Uh, but you can, you can simulate an arbitrary topology, you can simul simulate arbitrary failures, you can have, you know, 
uh, simulation at scale, you can feed in captured uh, old event screen, streams, etc. And it's high fidelity enough where, you, where we could actually develop our monitoring software before we had a network by basically pointing the monitoring uh, software at the simulated network and it generates, because it's running the exact binaries that run in, in production, it's generating the same signals that you would normally see. So you can actually test your, your monitoring software as well in, in the simulation environment and, and, and see whether, for example, your alerting for a certain condition actually is in fact triggered by that condition. Right? You just run that condition in your, in your simulated network and then you see whether your monitoring software uh, gives you an alert. Um, here's a little snapshot of, of, of our development. Um, um, you can really see this kind of overlays two releases, actually three. So you can see kind of one valley in, uh, uh, towards the left. Th that's where we sort of started to seriously roll out the first version of the network. And it really, that, its buck count of that release kind of goes to zero. But then the development started on the next release that had traffic engineering. You'll hear a little bit more afterwards. And actually, most recently, the, the, the future release um, um, is, is kind of pushing the buck count uh, up again. So just to recap, why are we excited about a software-defined WAN right, rather than a software-defined uh, data center LAN or, or enterprise LAN? Well, it's because all of these uh, very nice properties that it gives you. It makes the management uh, easier, uh, and you can pick what you pick the right tools for the right job, so to speak. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, 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 the you know, one punchline. Literally, the, the server that you run on uh, your traffic engineering on, compared to a server that typically is built into even a high-end router, is literally 25, 50 times faster. Right. So it's very easy with a modern, you know, 32 core workstation to, to do things that are very, very hard to do on your embedded processor that sits, you know, in a, in a networking box. So really a lot of things become easier and you can use all the team, all the tools that you, you normally use for regular software development. And so that makes the, the software both faster to develop, develop and, and, and higher quality. So now let me switch to, so after showing you all sort of these advantages in theory, let me tell you a little bit more how we, how we tried to put that into practice. So first, a, a word on our WAN. It's really kind of a misnomer. We have two backbones at Google. One is for traffic that goes to the internet, so to the user, and one that is for traffic between our data centers. These two backbones have very different properties in terms of what we want from them, right? Like user facing is very latency sensitive. It better be super reliable. It has to interface with the rest of the world. So it has to be, you know, very standards compliance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a, a, a relatively conventionally built uh, backbone for that. You know, lots of vendor gear sort of, you, you'd, it, it looks like an ISP, right? It is basically the ISP for Google. And so you'd recognize sort of all the elements uh, in there. The second backbone is the internal backbone, we sometimes call it a G-scale uh, backbone, and that's the, the um, that carries bits between data centers, and more precisely carries bits between data centers that have a little bit lesser SLA. So that could be storage replication, uh, search index replication, all kinds of other copy jobs for development, and so on. It carries a lot of traffic, but that traffic does not have a five nines type kind of requirement. And this is the backbone where we experimented with open flows because you know, it's tolerant of some, some failure, but at the same time, since it's big, it's still very expensive to run and complicated to run since there's many devices in it. So, so we wanted to, to see if we can get the advantages on that um, on, uh, one. Here's kind of how it looks like. Uh, basically, the boxes are the data centers. They're, they're public, so, so nothing new here. And you know this this network connects our our our, our data centers, and this is uh, basically the network as it is uh, uh, built out today. Um, this is uh, what it runs on. In we started this project in 2010. Uh, we could not buy any OpenFlow uh, hardware. Actually, we started it in, in 2009, and uh, depending on how you you count. So what we what we built is basically a 10 gig switch, uh, 128 ports. And 
you know, built from, from standard uh, chipsets that you can buy, so there's no custom ASIC, no nothing. Uh, so pretty simple bug, uh, 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 a simple box. Uh, you see, a, you see a, uh, uh, an early prototype uh, here. And it runs almost no software on it. So other than the software you need to kind of bring up the box and you know, initialize your cards and et cetera, you know, that, like the actual hardware uh, control, it runs an open flow uh, agent and nothing else. Um, so everything else is done in a controller. So there's no routing protocols, not even a CLI uh, on the box. So even the CLI runs, runs on the server. Because we wanted to experiment with how far we could get with moving software off of the box and, and we didn't have to go back. And, and, uh, and obviously it doesn't support you know, every routing protocol, it just supports the routing protocols through the controller that we need. In our case, the BGP and ISIS. Here's how you can imagine this kind of looks like. You know, you have two data centers uh, on, on each side. Each of them has basically a bunch of these switches that are cross-connected and then a line system between that actually, you know, transmits the traffic long distance. So the, the the, the, the switches are routers. I'm using the term interchangeably because it's software-wise, they're, they're actually, you know, you can't tell the difference because there's no routing running on the box itself. Um, these things don't have long-haul optics. They just plug into a long-haul box uh, and, and then that does the, does the actual transport. And then the controllers are regular servers, right? So we use our standard uh, Google hardware. So it's a, you know, multi-core, uh, uh, high memory type uh, kind of box. Uh, the deployment went over a number of, of uh, phases um, in, uh, you know, the first light, so to speak, in, in the real world outside the testing lab was, was about two years ago when we introduced uh, 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 this hardware sort of in parallel to our existing network in three of our data centers. So we had a little triangle and, uh, and you know, started to play with, with uh, the, the new network. And the network, at this point, the new, these new boxes looked to the existing network just like a regular box that talked ISIS and BGP. So the old network just saw some new adjacencies, but you know, there's nothing unusual per se. And um, we, we moved some of the optical routes over to, to have a bandwidth to play with, and we just kind of started playing with it. And at that point, the applications opted into the new, new network, so we picked some, some, you know, copy service or something like that and, and directed its flow to the new network to test sort of how it behaves in, in real life. Uh, then a little bit later, or actually sort of over the next uh, year, uh, year plus, we kind of rolled this out further across our network, uh, still in parallel with the, the, the existing networks, but we tried to get to all the sites to have a more realistic uh, uh, network, and we switched to the real, uh, to, you know, to a fully open flow controlled uh, uh, network. We tested how we can roll out new software uh, releases on, uh, on the controller boxes without um, interrupting the traffic on the network, uh, failover, you know, all, all these kind of things. Uh, and so then, at the end of uh, uh, 2011, uh, or you know, late 2011, we actually had 100% uh, uh, um, uh, of the traffic handled in one place, and then uh, rapidly uh, rolled that out to all places. So today, uh, all of our inter-data center uh, traffic is, is carried by this new network, so the old network is turned off. And also, in the meantime, then, we rolled out our next release, our next sort of major internal release that does traffic engineering. So the, it solves the problem that I showed you on the slides, where if you have all your different flows and you want to guarantee that there's enough capacity, it places those flows in the network um, through the centralized uh, traffic engineering uh, uh, and reacts to failures, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been running now uh, for, um, uh, yeah, sort of roughly half a year. Uh, uh, seriously and uh, with traffic engineering since um, I believe January. Um, and uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about our, our usage and our uh, um, uh, experience. Um, so here's just a traffic graph, all the, tra all the traffic on, on, the, on that network. 
And you can see kind of very rapid uh, growth. Mostly that comes from moving traffic into the new network. Remember, like for most of the time in this graph, we actually were running two, two inter data center backbones. And you know, more and more traffic was moved over as we turned up new sites. And then uh, in the end, actually, we also moved out some traffic from the internet facing uh, backbone uh, uh, to this that was um, um, suitable for this backbone. Uh, so we've been running a lot of traffic uh, uh, on it, and we've actually had pretty good experience uh, most of the time. I think one of the biggest ones is that the iteration time for introducing a new feature or fixing a bug is much faster than it was in the previous network. And that's really for two reasons. One is that testing is much better in a new system, right? We have the simulation environment. We can simulate our entire backbone, so before you run it, out in production, you can get a pretty high fidelity signal, whether it works or not, from your test environment. It's much easier to do that than before. And then also you have actually a simpler update process. Instead of having to update hundreds of devices um, uh, out there in the real world, uh, all of which are currently passing traffic and have a relatively thin CPU and little memory and you have to go and update them, and et cetera, you, you have a few servers, you know, control servers that you have to update. They're very, very powerful servers, tons of memory, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's not a, not a big deal. Plus, we do s software out rollouts in, in, in our data centers you know, with ser application servers all the time, so we have lots of tools that make this pretty easy. So testing was very important, and being able to roll out new features quickly. Um, um, I'm, I'm telling our team, really, Mar my goal eventually is push on green, meaning that whenever you have a build that actually passes all the submit tests, you push it out to production. Uh, and we're probably not really going to do that, but that's kind of the, the, the kind of fidelity that you would want to, from your testing environment. That really you could be confident that if your testing environment says this thing works, you know, because your testing is so exhaustive, you actually trust that it will work, right? And your, your network engineering team can't find any additional bugs. Um, so we're already seeing some benefits in utilization. The flow placement is better. Not because it's theoretically better, in the sense that you could get the same utilization by finally tweaking things in a traditional network, but the truth is you don't have time to finally tweak things all the time, right? Because six hours later, your network demands is different and you need to go tweak it again. And tweaking has a risk in the old system, right? You actually can, can have unintended consequences because these protocols interact with each other in, 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 in unforeseen ways. And so you don't really do it. And here, it's easy to tweak because it's all done in software, right? It's all done with a predictable, uh, stable algorithm. And so you do it all the time. It right? makes planning much easier, too. Uh, we're pretty happy with uh, stability uh, of, of the network. It's definitely meeting our SLA for our internal uh, backbone. We have um, um, uh, had outages, obviously, but actually uh, far fewer than I expected. I was willing to have a lot more outages in order to get uh, sort of make rapid progress on the actual goal of having a software managed backbone. So we're actually uh, very happy uh, with it. I can't give you percentage numbers here in the sense, oh, we're saving you know, X percent of our network cost because as you can see, right, this has just uh, been running really for real. We haven't really fully changed our, our operating uh, procedures to take advantage of all the uh, 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 th of, you know, of all the functionality. And also we haven't written all the software yet that we actually want to, to have sort of to enable, enable higher level control and really application driven, driven control of, uh, of the network. Um, so lots of things that we were hoping were opportunities with software defined networking definitely happened. Um, um, here's a list, right? It's much easier to understand what's going on in your network. Um, if you wonder what would happen if, right, it's easy to go to a test environment and just say, you know, create that situation and kind of see what happens. Um, um, predictability is, is high, right? The explanatory power, so to speak, of, of looking at the network and saying, okay, you know, I, here's the, the prioritization and why flows uh, uh, happen. You can convince yourself that it's correct, um, um, and so on. Uh, there's a number of challenges that we saw during development, uh, and none of these challenges really are uh, deal killers. So they're just things that you have to pay attention to. Um, the open flow control, uh, open flow uh, protocol is still uh, pretty uh, early, but it's really complete enough to do something 
uh, like what we're doing here, right? So it's, it's you know, certainly not done yet, but it's real and it's complete. So you can do, you know, real, uh, uh, real world network, you can run a real world network uh, on it, certainly no problem. Uh, I think one of the things that's gonna cause uh, some angst, uh, and justifiably in, in the industry, is that, that, you know, if you have now a controller, you don't want your controller to be a single point of failure, so you have a backup controller, you need to have some kinds of master election, et cetera. That stuff is hard to get right, uh, and, uh, and so you just need to, to focus on it. Um, similarly, it's not totally um, clear how to, you know, where you implement your software. We pick, we're taking a path to basically say, look, if something can be moved off the box, we want to move it off the box, and, and generally speaking, that's work, it worked out pretty well. But you know, not in exact science, and, and in our application, you know, when the box comes up, it's a very prescribed way in how we configure things, so you don't have a, a super general uh, bootstrap discovery uh, kind of protocol, but in a more general environment, you might you know, need to do a little bit more. Um, yeah, full programming at some point, we, you know, when, when we make a radical change in the network and you go update the flow tables of, of lots and lots of devices, um, you know, we ran into some performance problems that we were able to solve. But so generally speaking, those were the kind of things that, that caused us some trouble. But as I said again, I think I expected, um, you know, I didn't expect progress that would be that fast. So if you had asked me after, you know, 18 months after we start for real, will we carry 100% of traffic on this new network? I would have said, no, probably not. That's a pretty optimistic assumption. And also it's really worked out, you know, better than we had hoped. And I ascribe that a lot really to the easier way how you can write software when you write it in a standard in, in, in environment, you know, a reasonably powerful server versus when you write it for your embedded processor that has little memory and, and little CPU and so on. So um, um, to conclude, I, I hope I, I convince you that uh, OpenFlow in the WAN is a, is a very interesting and worthwhile uh, test case and actually application for OpenFlow and that it's real enough to use. Right? We run literally our largest network. The internal network is actually larger than the external one in terms of the amount of traffic it carries. So we run our largest uh, uh, network 100% on OpenFlow. And uh, even though it's early enough, in, uh, you know, early in, in the process, it's, it's, it's uh, stable and, and it's definitely meeting our, our requirements. Um, I think the, the, there's a lot more upside potential there too, right? Our data center backbone is actually relatively simple because we, have, we don't have that many data centers. And so, you know, a lot of things where we see a strong benefit, I imagine you'd actually see a much stronger benefit if you had a more classical ISB network with a bazillion pops and devices and so on uh, to manage. And so we're looking forward to seeing if similar things can have a benefit too on, on, on more traditional backbones once that here uh, supports uh, OpenFlow. And, uh, uh, um, you know, I think if you, if you take one thing away from this network, this clearly was, was sort of a bleeding edge uh, um, uh, effort in the sense that 2010, when we rolled out the first um, uh, 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 test boxes on our backbone, you know, OpenFlow wasn't even standardized. And in fact, I believe the ONF didn't exist uh, quite yet. But even there back then, it was actually good enough to do a lot of things uh, just fine, right? Certainly in our environment that allowed for a little bit of, of, of uh, uh, risk uh, on our backbone. So with that, uh, I'm happy uh, to take questions. And I'd like to also uh, thank uh, the teams really at Google who made this possible. Um, this was not just, I, I talked mostly about the engineering uh, part, you know, writing the software, et cetera, but this actually was a hard problem in terms of really planning and executing the rollout on our backbone without having our users, the internal applications at Google, notice it. And also, I'm very, very grateful to work at a company where the network, uh, the entire networking team, uh, including network operations, is actually willing and eager to embrace change and seize the opportunities rather than just the risks 
of, of a network. And really, it was, it was, uh, that was a big part of being able to go quickly and you know, with measured risk, but still as quickly as possible and actually roll something out uh, in the real world. And so I hope that you all uh, can benefit uh, from that when you try to do this in, in your own network so you know that at least someone has done it before and, and it actually works. So with that. Good morning. Yeah. Um, okay, sure. One of the questions that I had was, what are the challenges that you faced in terms of uh, network planning? Uh, if you compare a legacy network to an open flow network, uh, the connectivity and everything changes, and uh, what kind of challenges did you see? There? Um, so I mentioned that a little bit on the slides. I think the, the testability and the planning actually and the predictability of the algorithms goes sort of hand in hand. The same framework that you can use for testing, you can actually use to test out various other scenarios where you have different flows and what happens under failure of links, et cetera. So it's a big instrument that you can use for planning. But the other part is that you know that because the centralized algorithm sees the whole network, it is going to place the flows if they are placeable, right? And so you don't have these situations, which sometimes we had in the old network, where you know, theoretically the network fits the flows, but because of the way the protocols work, that solution is not actually found. And you have to go over provision a certain factor because you want to minimize the risk or at least manage the risk that no solution is found automatically and you have to go do a manual intervention after failure to make, your, you know, to make all your flows work. So generally speaking, I think our, our planning folks are happy, not deliriously happy, because we haven't built all the tools to actually do, you know, to automate the planning, right? But, but I think it's, it's it's, I speak for them to say that this is already better than what we had just because of the predictability and the ability to, when you have questions, actually go test it in a real world. Like if you have a question, like how will the system react if this demand comes in and then this link fails, you just set up a test in, you know, all virtualized and you will see what happens, right? And so you get comfort that your understanding of the system is actually correct. Right? Thank you. Yes? Stuart Raphael, IBM. Uh, first, I'd like to commend you on the uh, tremendous pioneering work that you've done. Uh, it's Thank quite you. an undertaking. Uh, the question that I have is, um, I know that you're not very clear or it's too early to tell what the benefits are derived from uh, the technology, but could you give us a sense of what some of the key criteria are that you will use in terms of determining what those benefits are? And then what is your gut reaction on the results of some of those benefits while not yet proven? Um, so, so I think in a high, and uh, you know, ultimately it is about the you know, total cost of ownership, right, of the network. How much do you pay to deliver um, X amount of capacity to your applications, and then also the service level to the applications, right? Do, do your applications understand what's happening in the network, and can they give you back a requirement that you can translate for sure into the network? Um, I think it's clear, even though we had to develop some hardware which has a sizable fixed cost, I think it's clear that we're ahead of, you know, in the TCO equation already, meaning that we will save money uh, amortizing the development uh, of, of, of what we did. Because it's already clear that the utilization improvements are going to be significant, right, in a large network if you have a 10% utilization improvement at the same uh, guarantees under failure. Uh, or better guarantees, that's worth a lot of money. And then also I think we will find that once we have really our manageability, et cetera, all, all uh, fully implemented, that we will be able to operate that network at the same or higher level of service with far fewer effort, like really integer factor uh, uh, less work because you're going to have, you know, the, the, the install, you know, part that's basically the same and you're going to have the repairs, you know, on M, et cetera, that's determined by the hardware and the lines, it's going to be the same. But then the configuration effort I expect to be much, much, much smaller. And also I think the monitoring and reacting to events is going to be smaller because the system should really in 99.x percent of the cases do the right thing automatically right away. So your notification will be, this link failed, everything's fine, please open a ticket to get it replaced, right? And so we don't have really operational experience yet, the duration to kind of tell where we can take advantage of all of these, but I'm, I'm, I'm highly confident that this is a substantial cost reduction in terms of unit cost, you know, your cost per megabit per month 
of, of bandwidth delivered at a, at a certain SLA, right? So I think it's, it's going to be a higher cost improvement than we could hope from any technology generation uh, uh, change, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, James Kemp, Erickson, do you run MPLS on your backbone? Uh, not on this one, no. So the, the switch I showed you does not support MPLS. We did on the, on the old one. Rick Merritt from EE Times. Could you talk a little bit about that 10 gig switch you developed and how is it different from just a, a, a server? What, a little bit about what's inside the hardware and, and anything that you can say about the next generation of it. Um, so so um, the, I don't want to focus too much on the hardware because that is a side piece. We had to do it because it was not an option to buy something. Uh, we'd love to buy a, a gear, right? The, actually, the right hardware kind of is available in the industry without the open flow support, right? And so um, in the next version of our network, we might very well run someone else's uh, gear. Um, it, um, uh, it just wasn't an option, right? And so this is a, you know, there's nothing special uh, in the sense that it's just a 10 gig switch, lots of ports, which you do need for scalability. We have a lot of traffic. But um, I, you know, I would have loved to be able to buy this, uh, and I'm confident actually I can uh, this year or next. Yes, or actually we should switch mics. Uh, Tao Gu with Centen Networks. Uh, you mentioned scalability of this network. You mentioned uh, this is the largest production uh, open flow network uh, ever uh, exists. I'd like to understand. Uh, uh, how many flows you're running on this network and uh, for the whole network or how many flows uh, per per node? Um, so I think that depends on how you define flow because um, we, so I, two things. One, I want to advertise a talk uh, uh, later, uh, I forget, I mean, is it today or is it tomorrow, right? By Amin Vadat uh, of Google that will talk in more detail about actually what we do in the software and, and the, uh, the, the pieces behind it. So that will answer your question. But higher level, you know, we actually aggregate flows in software outside the network and then tell the network to handle this category of flows in this particular way, right? Like you saw, we have in hardware, we have seven QS uh, uh, levels only. And for our application, that's just fine because we actually do the, a lot of scheduling. Like there's a bunch of copy traffic on this network. And we do the scheduling of that copy traffic outside the network. So we don't make it the network manage it, but we have sort of a copy scheduler. And it tells the open flow controller, I would like to have this much capacity between this place and that place at this priority. And then I shove in these copies, right? Because they need to be done by 6 PM. And then maybe some more real time-ish copies that maybe should have no more than a five second delay, I'll put into this other flow um, that has a higher QS on the network. And that's actually one of the advantages of this. You don't have to support all the functionality in the network. You now have sort of a more programmable machine, and so you can make it do a lot more things with the same hardware capability. So, so certainly that overflows hasn't been an issue uh, uh, for us. But it is a simpler network than an ISP connecting, you know, 10,000 subnets with different customers. So are those yeah. flows equivalent to routes, IP routes? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, those flows equivalent to, to uh, IP routes, like? Uh, no, no. Seiichi Kamara and EC Biglobe. Thanks for giving this really exciting presentation. I really enjoyed listening to the talk. Um, I was, uh, I had a simple question. Um, I was worried about how your NOC took this new technology. Did they have to learn something new? Um, if so, what kind of new technology did the NOC have to run? You know, they have to run 24 365. So, I mean, this must have been a really big gap for them. Yes, yes, and so that's why I actually uh, gave kudos really at the end, right? The, the, in the development cycle, we tried very much hard to bring in, uh, very much to bring in all the parties, including what we call NST, the, the uh, 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 monitoring, surveillance, and, and first line reaction, to make sure that they, they have the tools um, to operate this backbone. And 
with our simulation environment, we were actually able to do, develop these tools in parallel before we even had the hardware or a real working network. And that also makes it possible, and I don't actually know whether we did, to do training in a simulated environment. Uh, and so I think, you know, yes, we did, okay. So, so, um, so that actually went pretty well. And in many places, this is a simplification because they now can reason and observe the things that their users actually complain about, right? Their users don't call in and say, hey, you know, MPLS tunnel, tunnel XYZ, right, seems to be broken, right? They call in and say, you know, I have this replication going on and it's seeing lots of packet loss, right? And now you can actually directly see what they're talking about and you can say that, okay, right, we lost so much capacity in this region that, and you're priority three, right, not priority one. So, you know, until we have this fix in, you're going to see, you know, 20% packet loss. Uh, and there's nothing I can do, right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, last question. question yes. la okay. Yeah. Uh, Stan Kletko, Bakerypt. Um, actually, I would like to ask, to thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, from the security perspective, you guys are moving to more centralized environment. Have you ever thought uh, about the security of the controller? If somebody compromises the controller, what would be the security implications? Yes, great question. Um, so two things. First, I think intrinsically the security risk is lower because de facto, if someone compromises one router in your backbone, you're toast, right? They insert a default route, right? Zero cost to everywhere and your network is done, right? So I think there's, you know, single box compromise is lots of trouble. Uh, this actually in many ways is easier because there's fewer things that you have to kind of be careful about security wise. Also, you can make sure that basically nobody in the network can really talk to that box, right? So the regular network links do not have reachability to the controller, right? Only the open flow control port. And we do authentication with certificates, you know, on the, on the control link, so we feel pretty good about knowing that only this box can talk to the switch. Uh, yes, this box could be compromised. I think the biggest risk, like all the time, basically, is the insider risk, right? If someone in your NetOps team wants to do you harm and they have the password, uh, you know, there's an issue, right? But at the same time, I think in this thing, again, it's a software box, so it's easy to put in snapshotting, you know, automated rollbacks um, off like, you know, we have a snapshot of the config off, off, you know, off the machine, so you can, you can take another server and configure it as a replacement server, et cetera. So I think in a grand scheme of things, because you have all these software uh, capabilities, you're, you're going to end up in, in a better place than what you, you were before, where lots of people need access to your box because they need to log in, because they hand configure that box, right? All of that is gone, right? You, you know, there's no login to the box anymore. Right. And so I think that in, intrinsically makes, makes your network uh, more secure. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.